All right, so we'll we'll get going. All right, well, thanks everyone. Good you know, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jared Pasapia. I'm a neurosurgeon at Westchester Medical Center. So I really want to thank Michael Rothbaum, um, Sergio Godix, and Ryan Radnowski, Radwanski for the opportunity to speak today. And they had invited me to talk about neuroradiology. So just a very brief way of background. I did all my training in Philadelphia. I was uh, did residency at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, during my sixth year, I did an infolded fellowship in peripheral nerve surgery. And after residency, did a pediatric neurosurgery fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So I, after fellowship, joined at, as primarily a pediatric neurosurgeon at Maria Ferrari's Children's Hospital, which is part of Westchester Medical Center in Valhalla, New York. Uh, but I still do cover a, you know, a good amount of general call. And for the purpose of this lecture, I really drew a lot of real life case examples that I encountered um, in my first year of practice to try to pick out some representative ones to help go over some teaching points for neuroradiology. So I think really any of the, for students, any field that you go into related to neuro, um, you know, neuroradiology is really a, a fundamental part of it. So I'm hoping to give you several pearls to take away from this today. And we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. So, you know, neurosurgery involves um, cranial surgery, spine surgery, peripheral nerve. And I decided to limit this to focus on cranial neurosurgery just because there's so much, you know, topics to cover. And I think uh, imaging is really, you know, a key part of, of the cranial procedures. So I know there's um, kind of a diverse audience. So we'll start out just with some basics about looking at head CT, and then we'll move on to MRI. And I group this in terms of different pathologies. So looking at trauma, hydrocephalus, vascular, infection, tumor, and then a little bit of epilepsy and, and developmental conditions such as Chiari malformation. And I think it probably will be best, um, what I can do is stop um, intermittently. And then if, some, uh, if we have some questions, we can address those through the Q&A function. As we said, I know there's students of, of varying um, levels, so we'll just start from, from the ground up and, and work our way to more advanced imaging. But this is a basic normal head CT, and this is basically derived from x-rays, and things that are very solid and dense appear very bright. So we see right around the edges here, this white area is the skull, so bone is very dense. And conversely, things that are less dense, such as water, are very dark. So we see the ventricles, the fluid spilled spaces within the brain are, are quite dark here. The brain is a mixture. It's made up of some, it's more solid than just water, but it does have a lot of water content, so it's gray. And in fact, we see a little bit darker gray along the white matter. So this is a, a typical normal axial head CT. If we talk a little more about the fluid spaces, these are the ventricles. So we have two lateral ventricles. You can probably see it a little better on this image, one on the right, one on the left. And just to trace out the pathway, CSF gets produced by the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles, goes down a connection called the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. From there, it travels through another connection called the aqueduct, so we call the aqueduct of Sylvius, into the fourth ventricle. From there, it goes through some small openings that go to basically a space surrounding the brain or down the central canal within the spinal cord. So, Head CTs can be viewed with what are called different windows. So on the left side of the screen, we have what's called a brain window, similar to the one we looked at before, where things that are less dense, things like air, appear very dark. And as we said, things that are very dense, like the skull, appear very bright, with the brain being somewhere in between. Here we have bone windows. This really highlights the, the bones and kind of suppresses a lot of the other signal. Again, though, air or things that are less dense are very dark. Here we see the different um, orientations that are useful, uh, especially as you start intern year, let's say, anytime you're asked to look at imaging, it's always useful to say what the scan is <clears throat> and then what the orientation is you're looking at. So this would be a head CT. On the left here is an axial, sagittal, which is more of a side view, and then coronal, which is kind of head-on view as if you're slicing a loaf of bread. So 
different bone windows can show different things. So on the left here, we see this very bright kind of uh, lens shaped structure. So we said things that are bright are more dense. It's not quite as dense as bone, but this density is more um, indicative of blood products. We then look at the bone windows and sure enough, we can see a fracture in this area that we really were not able to appreciate that well on the initial head CT. If you look closely, there's a little dot here, which is dark. And we had said one thing that's dark is air. So putting this together, it's possible that this fracture may have been open and some air may have leaked in. So this air is a little bit of a hint that there could be a fracture, which we see better on the bone windows. You'll also notice a little bit of hyperdensity outside the skull, which is probably a, a hematoma basically in the scalp. So really the take home point is that different windows can highlight different pathologies. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of background, we can start to get into some cases. So this is a case I did pretty early um, after finishing training. This is a three month old baby who basically rolled off of um, her crib. So it was a fall, you know, probably more than three feet. And right off the bat, we could see nice skull here. All of a sudden we see this large hyperdense area. So this is most consistent with blood. And if you look more closely, you know, on previous images, if we go back to the, the start, you see the ventricles, you know, there's one on each side. You can see where the middle is very nicely. If we go back to this patient, you see the ventricles have been pushed away from the bleed. So the bleed is exerting what's called mass effect, where the brain is really a sponge. If you, if you exert some pressure, that sponge gets squashed and it pushes structures over. So we see evidence of mass effect here. And we also see evidence of midline shift. I mean, if we drew a line in the middle of the skull, we'd see that the structures are pushed away from the pathology. So mass effect, midline shift, these are terms that you'll hear radiologists use very frequently. And this is simply a diagram showing the same thing, that there's a collection of blood here. It's most likely an epidural, epi meaning above and dura, you know, the covering of the brain. So this bleeding occurring outside the dura, it usually occurs in the setting of skull fractures and commonly the middle meningeal artery is an artery that, that could be affected. And this diagram does a nice job, I think, of showing some of the, the manifestations of that mass effect. So for instance, there's a part of the temporal lobe a structure called the uncus. You see that it's getting pushed over. You see the evidence of shift, the ventricles. This one is effaced, meaning it's, it's you know being compressed. And then this structure, the cingulate, is being pushed over as well. And, and subfalcine refers to below the fox. The fox is simply a, a dural separation from the right and left side. So the brain is being shifted over. So with all that shift, as a neurosurgeon, your goal is to relieve that pressure. So this patient was taken to the operating room. An incision was made over the area of hemorrhage. The bone was removed and simply the blood was, was taken out and any bleeding points were coagulated. So you can see now on the post-operative scan, you know, the midline shift is it's much less dramatic. The structures are nearly midline and the ventricles look symmetric again. So there's less mass effect. You can actually make out normal gyri and sulci. So gyri are the kind of mountains, sulci are the valleys, and the brain is set up that way to increase the surface area of the cortex. This is just a coronal view, again, showing that the blood has been removed. There's a little bit of a fluid, what we'd call a hygroma or a collection of CSF that likely will resolve on its own over time. But that's an example of a craniotomy for an epidural hematoma. Now, if we take a closer look at this scan, we notice right away normal sulci and gyri on this side. However, we're really not able to make that out quite as well. So these sulci are effaced. And the reason for that we see on other scan is that there's this large space occupying lesion. And when patients get head CTs, they're laying flat in the scanner with their head back. You can imagine that thicker blood products will, will settle out by gravity and create a fluid level. So we see that here where some of the, the CSF is above, more of the blood products are below. Regardless, this is taking up space in the head and it's pushing on the normal brain. So again, this is something that surgery would be recommended for. Now in this case, I did simply a burr hole, which is where you make an opening in the bone. You use a, a drill to do this. It's about the size of you know, a nickel or so. And when you do this, really, once you open the dura, this, the blood products are usually under pressure and will basically shoot right out of this, this opening. I usually do two openings so that I can irrigate aggressively through one opening and push the blood products out. So you can see this is the post-operative scan showing um, you know, really minimal residual blood in the area. 
then this is a, a drain that I usually will leave behind for subdurals to try to reduce the likelihood of any recurrence. Okay, so that's an example of burr holes for subdural. And this cartoon just simply summarizes epidural and subdural. So epidural, as we said, it's outside the dura, whereas subdural is the sub or below the dura. Kind of see, see it tracking a little more closely along the brain surface. Epidurals usually caused by bone fracture and rupture of an artery, such as a middle meningeal artery. Subdurals, on the other hand, are usually caused by uh, tearing some bridging veins that connect between the, the brain and some of the more superficial structures. Okay, another example. So this, you could see an extra axial, meaning a collection outside the brain. And again, causing significant mass effect or, and, and sulcal effacement. We're able to see sulci here, cannot see any here. The ventricular system is very much pushed to the left. I, I've seen in the past where many times patients come in and um, you know, surgeons perhaps in other fields such as trauma will see this and say, okay, this, this collection doesn't seem too large. Not like the collection I showed previously, but really, this, this uh, amount of blood here is only a kind of secondary sign that there's been a great traumatic injury to the brain tissue itself, such that the brain is swelling and being pushed over. Um, in this case, when we relieved some of this bleeding and over time, the brain started to, to settle back out and you can make out again, normal soul sight. Whenever there's acute blood, I think an important teaching point is that really a craniotomy is required. A burr hole here simply would not give you enough um, exposure to take care of any active bleeding and to really be able to suction or, or irrigate out all this active blood clot. So this is just a quick um, you know, cartoon of, of the type of surgery. We usually make a reverse question mark shaped incision on the scalp, drill multiple, basically take down as one flap, a myocutaneous flap, both the skin and muscle. This is the temporalis muscle, the muscle that you could feel when you, when you chew. We use a drill to make several burr holes and then connect the, the dots basically to remove this bone temporarily. We then open the dura, the covering on the brain, and wash out any blood below. Close the dura and then replace the bone with plates and screws. So this is an example from the operating room where we can see that the bone has been removed. And this dura usually appears um, a nice pink healthy color. We see that it looks very taut and that there's obvious contusions and bruising below. When you open the dura, you see this um, kind of thick jelly-like partially coagulated blood products that you simply will, will irrigate and, and suction away. And then we close the dura. So just in staying with the theme of trauma, this is an example of a skull fracture. So we're looking at, at bone windows. We see that the nice linear structure is, or, you know, is, is interfered with here in this area and it's depressed. So this was a, a young boy about five years old who was skateboarding without a helmet, fell and struck his head. Luckily, there's no injury um, below this area. You should always look to see if there's any blood products in this area or actually across the brain. We call this a counter coup injury. The brain basically sits in a sac, the dura, and it's filled with fluid. The brain can shift during a trauma such that it, you know, it would strike the contralateral side. Looks like in this child, though, um, there was no additional injury to the brain. So he was taken to surgery due to this fracture being open and depressed. Um, this was an impacted piece of bone that we removed. And I believe for him, we simply placed a, a mesh over the defect. Here, it's a little more pronounced, the fracture. We call this one a ping pong fracture, as if you took a ping pong ball and, and basically crushed part of it. So again, we look, don't see any evidence of any uh, brain injuries, epidural, subdural bleeding. However, um, for the family, this was a cosmetic mm -hmm. issue. And to fix this, we uh, took the child to the OR I started out by making a small burr hole just adjacent to the depressed bone. I then placed a curved instrument of Penfield 3 to try to elevate this. Just if you have a, you know, an accident with your car where there's a dent, you try to basically bang the dent out. However, this was, was quite fused. So we ended up turning a, a bone flap around it, meaning we, we removed the bone circumferential to this depression. And then we can use some instruments to, to more easily bend the bone and then replate it using absorbable plates and screws. So we're able to, uh, to fix that. Here's a much more significant example. You could see that um, this is a you know, pretty severe depressed skull fracture. You see the hematoma and the soft tissue above the skull. And when you look below, you see evidence of contusion or injury to the brain itself. So as we talked about, blood is usually bright on CAT scans, on CAT scans. 
as is the bone here. So this would require operative intervention. Here's an example again of, of a bifrontal contusion. And we look counter coup area, we don't really see any injury that, that's um, manifested yet in the, in the posterior part of the brain. Okay, so we discussed um, a few different traumatic um, presentations. So I just wanna shift gears a little bit. We saw that blood was very bright. Now we're looking at a head CT where we see a very large area of you know, a little bit darker tissue. So this is an ischemic stroke. And really there are three major blood vessels that supply the supratentorial brain. You have your anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, which supplies this territory, and posterior cerebral. We see you know, almost all of the, the MCA or middle cerebral artery territory um, you know, has had a stroke here. Now the brain, just like other parts of the body, if it's injured, it will swell. The problem is that the brain is stuck in this tight box, the skull. So there's not really a lot of places for it to swell. What will happen is as uh, the pressure goes up, things like CSF and blood will be pushed out. Ultimately, the brain itself can be pushed out through what we call herniation, where the tissue could go through the foramen magnum, which is a large opening at the base of the skull. It's almost like squeezing on a, a toothpaste container and having the toothpaste push out. Obviously something that um, this could be lethal and you do everything you can to avoid. So one method um, to deal with this, which can be a life-saving procedure, is to do a decompressive craniectomy. So what we do is we basically open this compressive box by removing almost half of the skull on one side. And you can see when you do this, the brain is unable to expand out and swell rather than uh, swelling within. So this is what a, it would look like with a, a large segment of that bone removed. Um, it's similar incision to what we looked at previously um, with burr hole placement. You have to, of course, avoid some of the large venous sinuses that are nearby, especially the sagittal sinus. So for these cases, you know, if these are cases you may help with in the intern year getting set up. You always want to be very sure of where the midline is. Sometimes when I shave the patient's head, I'll, um, I'll simply shave right along the midline so there's no question about where that structure is. Really, the only damage you can do here is, is to get into this superior sagittal sinus while you're turning your, your bone flap. And this is just a nice cartoon that shows the bone edge, the bones removed, and these arrows show how the brain is, is allowed to expand and herniate outwards. Here's an example um, intraoperatively. A patient's face is in this area. This is temporalis muscle. It makes several burr holes, and these are variable, the locations you choose. But it's a pretty sizable um, bone flap. You want to try to get about 14 centimeters. Here you see you know, relatively normal appearing brain. However, it's quite swollen. You know, the brain should not really be swollen above the level of the bone edge, which it is here. And this is showing a dural patch, which I usually do not so in a dural patch, I think it defeats the purpose of um, really trying to allow the brain to expand out and could be compressive potentially. So I simply lay a, a layer of synthetic dura called duragen and then close over that. Now, if these patients survive, um, you know, they, they will have a cosmetic defect where sometimes their skin flap can be quite sunken. So what we can do if we have the bone available, we replace it. And in the past, uh, believe it or not, the bone was usually fractured and placed in the subcutaneous tissue of the abdomen. And that relates to kind of wartime experience where that was really the best way to make sure that the patient, um, you know, had their own bone flap and there were no mix-ups and no one losing the bone flap. Nowadays, we have bone freezers where the bone can be stored for several months. Or an option we use frequently is to have a, a synthetic implant created. So this is an example of a peak cranioplasty. It's a uh, basically manufactured based off a very fine cut head CT, almost as if it's 3D printed. Uh, Peak is a, is a poly ether ether ketone that um, you know, is very strong, just like normal bone. So you can see that here, I've placed um, titanium plates and screws to help affix it to the, the normal skull, which you see on the surroundings. So these, these implants fit extremely well. This is just a, a Jackson Pratt drain that we'll, we'll put down over the implant. And then this is the temporalis muscle and galia, which will close. So this is a nice way to uh, restore that symmetry of the skull in patients who survive craniectomy. So that, that covers trauma. Um, let's see, I see there's one question, which um, let me take a quick break and I'll try to answer that. So the question asks, in the subdural hematoma example, how fast do you need to perform the craniotomy for optimal results? So what we'll do, um, 
I'll just kind of talk through this. Um, so that's a great question. So I'd say a lot of it depends on the patient's neurological exam. So whether it's an epidural hematoma or subdural hematoma, if a patient presents um, basically obtunded, not following commands, you know, difficult to arouse, and the scan shows significant compression, some cutoffs you could keep in mind, um, midline shift of greater than half a centimeter or thickness of the clot greater than a centimeter, these are all indications for surgery to be done emergently. So if this patient, for instance, got a scan in the emergency room, I would have them go up um, you know, emergently to the operating room. The, the, the approach there is that you wanna get any volume of, of blood that you can take off to make more space within the head, it basically has an exponential um, decrease in the pressure. So if it's an epidural, when I make my incision um, right by the ear, I'll simply make a small incision, immediately place a burr hole and allow that blood to shoot out. And that, that really could help to save the patient very quickly rather than taking you know, this short amount of time, but still additional time to turn a full flap and you know, more carefully open the dura. So I think the short answer to your question is um, immediately if the patient's exam is poor. If the patient comes in, um, I'm gonna just bounce back to a few slides. If they come in with a subdural hematoma that looks, let's see that earlier example, something like this, you know, I could tell this, this blood is not acute, it's not bright white, so they must have had this for quite some time. This is a little bit less urgent. So this I would take in a more, you know, urgent manner, not have to rush the patient to the operating room. So that's, that's a good question. The timing really matters here. And then just along the lines of timing, for strokes that we see here for large ischemic strokes, usually the brain will swell within the first 48 hours. So for a patient like this, if they're, usually they're, they're neurologically have a, it's called an MCA syndrome where they're weak on the contralateral side, their eyes, um, you know, will be faced a certain direction. These patients, I try to take the OR within 48 hours but they usually don't need to go emergently unless your exam rapidly deteriorates. And then it's a question about, would it be better to perform a craniotomy instead of a burr hole for chronic subdurals with clots? And yeah, so my, my kind of um, guiding principle here is that if there's any acute blood, I think it requires a craniotomy. The reason for that is there could be several, um, several membranes within it, and I think a burr hole does not allow you to, to really get that blood out thoroughly. If it's a chronic bleed, um, then I think a burr hole is okay. And the risk of the peak implant rejection uh, was another question here. You know, I, I haven't seen that um, someone having a peak implant allergy. So I, I don't know if that's um, been reported, but um, you know, anytime you put a foreign body in, always something, um, you know, useful to consider. Sorry, very good. So yeah, please keep, you know, questions coming as we go. And I think just for time, I'll, um, move on to the next uh, phase here. So we'll talk about some vascular lesions. So we'll stick with HET-CT a little longer. So this is a CAT scan now, again, showing hyperdense or bright material here, concerning for blood. <clears throat> now, in adults, um, you know, hypertension is a very common cause of bleeding. We would call this an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, meaning within the brain tissue, intra inside parenchyma, meaning the brain tissue. And in children, this was a case of a 21-year-old who came in with very severe headache. In kids, you know, usually they don't have hypertension and their blood vessels um, you know, are relatively healthy. So anytime you have a pediatric patient with an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, you should always think about a vascular malformation. So one possibility is an arteriovenous malformation, abbreviated AVM. So this is a, um, you know, thought to mostly be congenital. And what happens is usually arteries will go flow into capillaries where the arterial pressure gets dissipated by the multiple capillaries. And then they coalesce again to form veins to drain the blood. In an AVM, the artery runs directly into the vein without any intervening capillaries. So you could imagine all the arterial pressure is now being absorbed by this vein that really wasn't built to absorb it. And you could have rupture of those vessels and, and a bleed like this. So to, to work this up further, um, a child with an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, at least a CTA should be performed. That was done here. So a CTA, CAT scan with the A standing for angiogram, just um, better shows the blood vessels by using a contrast agent. And you can see here this kind of enlarged vessel right next to the area of the bleed with this dot here. 
So really the gold standard for this is to perform an angiogram. And you know, this could be a lecture for neuroradiology in and of itself angiograms, but basically um, you'll gain access either in the, in the groin or the ex one of the extremities, in the upper extremities sometimes now, thread a catheter up through the blood vessels, passing through the heart and further up towards the brain, in this case up the internal carotid artery. And then we see here that along the anterior cerebral artery, we see this early draining vein. And this is really a key uh, feature of an arteriovenous malformation that, you know, usually the blood should go through capillaries. We don't see the veins right away, but because there's no intervening capillary bed, the vein lights up much earlier in what's called the arterial phase. This little cluster or tangle of vessels is called venitis. So these are important features to think about, the size of the lesion, the, the venous drainage, and also um, where it's located, if it's an eloquent cortex, meaning parts of the brain that if you injure, the patient won't have a devastating injury, such as language problems or weakness. This is a reconstruction here. You can see this tangle of abnormal blood vessels. So an AVM that's bled should be treated. And in that patient, we did a craniotomy and removed the AVM. Nice thing about these is if, if they're all taken out, that could be a cure for the patient. And that way reduce the risk of this bleeding, you know, over the patient's lifetime. So this is a different type of uh, bleeding pattern. This is intraventricular hemorrhage. So here we see the ventricles, which should be nice and dark, are actually bright and they're filled with blood. So I just wanted to make one distinction here. This was something that um, I remember my chief resident would really harp on because it, it kind of takes you down two different pathways. So I'll explain this. This here we refer to as a subarachnoid hemorrhage where you know, some small vessels within the subarachnoid space were injured in a trauma and have bled. This pattern of bleeding is also in the subarachnoid space, but you can see that it's much more extensive. And we would call this on the left, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. The one on the right, we would call concerning for aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, this blood usually will be washed out over time, really not a significant thing. Subarachnoid hemorrhage though is much more significant. So I think when I would call my chief, you know, in the middle of the night and say we have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, he immediately wanted to know, is it the type that nothing to do or the type that something needs to be done? So in the aneurysmal one, you would have to get a, a CTA to look for an abnormal blood vessel that could explain this, this diffuse pattern of bleeding in the subarachnoid space. So just something to think about when you guys are, are interns. This is just a slide to kind of summarize the different patterns of bleeding that we talked about. So intraparenchymal hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage, and traumatic subarachnoid blood. Now, the, one of the treatments, or one of the times when we do this procedure, it's called an external ventricular drain, is when there's intraventricular blood. You can imagine that some of these blood products will um, either from a, you know, physically block off the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, or as the, product, product, the blood products break down, they could basically, uh, as they're absorbed, they could scar some of the arachnoid granulations, which are used to absorb CSF, and it could lead to hydrocephalus, so which hydro water, cephalus brain, condition of, of water on the brain. So the treatment for this is placement of an external ventricular drain. And this is something that you can do, you know, as an, your intern year at the bedside. We use different anatomical landmarks to help guide where to place the incision and um, how to place the actual catheter. But the idea is you make a small incision in the skin in the right frontal area. We choose the right frontal area because most people, even left-handed people, have language on the left side. And if you say frontal, you know, ahead of the coronal suture, you stay away from the motor strip. So after you make a small opening in the skull, you'll make an opening in the dura, and then you pass your catheter into the ventricle. It's tunneled out under the skin and attached to this drainage bed at the bedside. And the nice thing about this is that you really have complete control over the patient's cerebrospinal fluid. You're able to drop the bag lower than the level of the head, and you can drain more fluid. And these are usually centered over the level of the tragus. All right, so something you'll get very familiar with. And we discussed this a little bit earlier, but just to review, um, this is the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. So we'll shift gears and we'll talk a little more about um, CSF. Um, so cord plexus makes CSF. This is produced in the lateral ventricle, travels into the third ventricle by way of the foramen of Monroe. This goes through the Sylvian aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. From there, it goes out of <clears throat> a few different foramen or openings, foramen of um, 
Magendi and Luchka, or it's also referred to as the median aperture for Magendi. This fluid uh, will actually go around and bathe the brain. It then gets absorbed into the arachnoid granulations, which uh, dump the fluid into the venous system. And this cycle repeats. So at any time you have about 150 cc's of fluid, CSF in the body. <coughs> Excuse me. And this gets turned over about three times a day. I'll take a quick sip of uh, water here. All right. So with that knowledge, we can talk a little more about hydrocephalus. So a very important um, concept I wanted to convey was communicating versus non-communicating hydrocephalus. So if you think about a river, if you were to build a dam, some of that fluid would, would build up upstream. So very similar situation you could think of, basically a plumbing problem where, let's say in this example, the green arrow is showing these aqueducts. If this is very narrow, you'll see a buildup of fluid upstream. So you see enlargement of the, the lateral ventricles and the fourth and the third ventricle. In this example, um, you see that everything is, is enlarged, the lateral, the third, and the fourth. So this first example where there's a, you know, a, a pinch point here, that's called obstructive hydrocephalus or non-communicating, meaning that all the ventricles are not in direct connection or communication with each other. You see the fourth ventricle is very small, the rest are enlarged. Here, everything is enlarged, so we call that communicating hydrocephalus, where there's really no focal obstruction. The obstruction is, is really at the end of the pathway where the, the CSF is not getting absorbed or too much is being produced. So that's important in guiding some of your, your treatments. So for communicating hydrocephalus, um, basically uh, VP shunt or ventricular peritoneal shunt placement is, is indicated. This is kind of our gold standard. And I'd be remiss not to include this as a, as a pediatric neurosurgeon since this is a big, big part of our practice. But very quickly, a shunt involves an incision in the scalp, placement of a of catheter into the ventricle, just like with an external ventricular drain. It's connected to a valve that can, in some cases, be regulated to change how much flow, how much CSF is drained. And then that's tunneled under the skin to another part of the body. Most commonly, this goes into the peritoneal space, and then the walls of the abdomen will absorb this fluid. In older kids, we can place it into the pleural space, so the place around the lungs. Fluids absorbed by the chest wall, or you know, the other option is to place it intracardia, so into the heart, and this fluid will will drain directly into the bloodstream, very similar to the way you would place a central line. And I just thought um, some of you may be familiar with this, just to show you a few of the adjuncts we use in the operating room. This um, is an example of neuro navigation, where there's a fixed reference point on the patient and an electromagnet close by. And then basically take a pointer that's not shown here, but you trace the contours of the face. And then a computer will register this information and hook it, you know, basically um, correlate it with, with the imaging, the MRI that you've obtained preoperatively. Such that if I touch the patient's nose, you'll see a dot on the patient's nose. And I'm sure as many of you have seen on your rotations, this has really revolutionized how we do shunt surgery as well as tumor surgery. You're able to plan out your exact um, trajectory, where you're going to enter, where you're going to end, where your target is, the distance, help you plan the length of your catheter, and really help to get catheters very precisely in, in very small locations. Uh, just to share another approach here, for patients with obstructive hydrocephalus, let's say, for example, the one that we looked at where the aqueduct was very narrowed, you can actually come in and do a procedure where you leave no hardware. And a lot of this um, grew out of experience in Africa where neurosurgeons would volunteer their time for about a month, place many shunts, but shunts are not perfect systems. They're made of plastic, they can fracture, they can break, pull out. When these neurosurgeons left the country, these, these kids really didn't have a treatment to, to deal with these complications. So this procedure was developed as a way to treat hydrocephalus without having to leave any hardware behind. And this involves um, similarly a, you know, a burr hole and opening the bone, passing this time an endoscope, which is basically a camera with a light at the end, into the ventricle. So going through the lateral ventricle, through frame of Monroe into the third ventricle. That shown in pictures here, this is the lateral ventricle, some choroid plexus leading through the frame of Monroe. When we pass through, it looks at this view. Here we're passing a, uh, basically a Foley catheter pretty much, same thing you do with the bladder, passing this balloon tipped uh, catheter in and expanding this, uh, the floor of the third ventricle. So we're basically poking through in order to 
create a new channel for CSF to drain within the body. So very, um, you know, in my opinion, very beautiful surgery where you can really see all the anatomy. Uh, the fornix runs in this area. These are some large veins along the septum and the thalamus. These are the mammillary bodies. And really below this uh, tuft of arachnoid is the basilar artery and the uh, posterior cerebral artery. So a very high stakes, high real estate kind of territory here where you're working. Okay, and then just to, to help you when you start to see these patients, um, you know, in the emergency room with shunts, for instance, preoperatively, you have a patient with very large ventricles, signs of increased pressure, place a shunt, the ventricles come down. If you see them back and the ventricles are back up, that's definitely consistent with a shunt failure. The only reason I put this slide in is that an important learning point is that not all patients who have shunt failures have enlargement of their ventricles. So if you see it, that, that really supports shunt failure. If you don't, it doesn't really exclude it. Just something to keep in mind. And here's an example of a patient that we did on ETV where they had aqueductal stenosis and the ventricles came down afterwards. <clears throat> I put this, this slide in here because that's not always the case. Um, I would say VP shunt is a much more um, effective way of decreasing the ventricle size. Whereas ETV, you do not always see such a dramatic decrease in the ventricle size. And of course, studies are still going to see if that has clinical significance or not. Here are some examples of shunt valves. It's one in the center here. There, there are numerous different types, but the idea is that with the lateral skull x-ray, you could usually get a good look at some of the markings. This is the catheter going in the ventricle. This is the valve. And then this gets tunneled down to the abdomen or another body site. Just another picture that the axials on bone windows can be very helpful to trace the, the valve and tubing. Just as a good reference for you, the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery has a website they call the Shunt Guide. It has pretty much all of the uh, commonly used valves on the market. It goes through the, the radiographic appearance of each, the different pressure settings. So I, I'd say this is, this is a website to check out and to kind of save in your favorites for when you're an intern and you're trying to sort out which valves people have. Very, very helpful. I put this slide in just to show that you know, I've been showing very normal ventricles. However, there are, are plenty of patients with um, abnormal ones. This is a patient with holoprosencephaly, where some of the midline structures do not fuse and there's really just one large ventricle. And this is, this is on a continuum. And this is just an example of some dysmorphic ventricles, which just look very abnormal. And you can tell this patient has a shunt. You can see the valve here on the side. Okay, so I'd like to switch now towards MRI. And why don't I take a quick break just to see if there's any, any new questions here. Um, we have one or two from the TBI or traumatic brain injury part. Let me see if I could go through some of those quickly. So first question is in the setting of traumatic brain injury, how do you gauge the risk of hemorrhagic progression and the potential need for decompression? So these are great questions. This, this gets a little more at, at some of the, the management things. So it's good you guys are, are thinking ahead about that. So many times if I have a patient who has significant traumatic brain injury or, or TBI. Let's take, for example, the one with that, that frontal contusion that was pretty impressive. Of course, we want to follow their exam. So we use the Glasgow Coma Scale, such that um, we give points for motor movement, eye opening, and, and speech. If the score is over eight, I usually will have the patient admitted to the ICU and just observed with neuro checks every hour. If they decline, you would get a, a rapid, you know, a, a head CT. Really, any neurological change, you always want to get a head CT to see what the cause is. And if the exam is poor and there's a, you know, a, 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 a lesion that you can take out, you know, you could talk about doing that. Um, so the, the question gets at, though, how do you gauge the risk of hemorrhagic progression? So usually, if it's in the temporal lobe, those seem to progress more. So what do I do for a patient who had a GCS over 8? I would get a CAT scan in a short interval, you know, maybe four to six hours. Some people do longer, some people do shorter, just to see if this um, clot is expanding. If it is, that's someone you need to monitor very closely. If it's not, you know, you would still probably keep them in the ICU for the day. If the Glasgow coma score is less than eight and you really don't have a good exam to follow, a neurological exam, you could place an ICP monitor, which is similar to an EBD in that you just drill a hole in the right frontal area, but you place a fiber optic um, basically probe into the brain tissue itself, and that can give you a readout on, on intracranial pressure. And using that, 
Um, you can better manage the patient giving things like hypertonic saline or mannitol, and then figure out if, if medicine is working or if you need to escalate to potentially surgical decompression. So that's, um, you know, temporal lobe contusions I'm a little more concerned about. So for an EDD in a pediatric patient, this question asks, is it preferable to choose Coker's point instead of Keen's? So Coker's point refers to kind of that right frontal area. Keen's point, I believe, is um, more of a posterior approach. So for EDDs, I, I personally like the right frontal area. I think it's, um, it's positioning wise, it's much easier. Um, the patient's usually laying supine, you stand at the head of the bed and can do your work. Uh, coming in from the posterior area, it's something I think most residents are less um, used to doing. You'll see that though in pediatrics, for whatever reason, I think it's because when you do shunts, this is just my, my personal theory, for a child, you can really turn their head to one side. And if you do a shunt incision in the parietal occipital area, you can make it down to the belly in one pass. If you do a frontal shunt, you have to make a separate relaxing incision behind the ear and then pass down to the belly. So I wonder if for historic reasons in kids, it's just easier to do a right um, occipital, right occipital shunt and make it in one pass. Uh, but that, that's you know, my understanding of it. And then we have another question here, whether tests can be done to diagnose shunt failure if ventricles appear to be non-dilated on CT? So yeah, no, I love these questions. This is really showing that you're thinking ahead to um, how to manage these patients. So there's no great um, single test for a shunt failure. I wish you could do a blood test and say, shunt working or shunt not. A lot of it is, is kind of your gestalt um, take on things. You know, first and foremost, you know, for a child that the patient's mother or father usually could tell you, look, you know, my son clearly has headaches, vomiting, and funny eye movements when he gets sick. And this is exactly the same as it was when he got the shunt put in. That, that's pretty convincing. Um, but there's a few other adjuncts you can use. One is you could ask your ophthalmology colleagues to look in the eyes and look for papilledema. These are changes that occur in the retina that you could visualize by looking um, you know, into the eyes. And that usually shows signs of longstanding pressure problems. Second thing you can do is a lumbar puncture. This, um, you get an opening pressure when you put your needle in. If the ventricles communicate with the lumbar space and it's not obstructive hydrocephalus, you can see a very elevated um, pressure on lumbar puncture. If similarly, if the patient already has a shunt in place, uh, many times what I do is I take a butterfly needle and I will tap the reservoir of the shunt. So you saw in other pictures a little bubble that a shunt has. I basically will, will place the uh, butterfly needle in and it has a tube of fluid, I hold that tube up. If there is CSF shooting out of the top of that tube, you know, that suggests to me that there is a, um, an ICP problem I and mean, the pressure is very high. And I would take that, that patient for uh, expiration. If no fluid is shooting out, what I'll do is attach a syringe to the, the butterfly needle tubing and gently pull back. If I can gently pull back and CSF comes up, that tells me that the catheter in the brain from running from the, the inside of the ventricle to the valve must be open because I'm able to pull fluid back easily. If I'm not able to draw fluid back, that suggests to me that the shunt you know, perhaps is clogged. Sometimes you get some brain debris or choroid plexus that can block it. And I would take the patient for a shunt revision. The last thing you can do from the shunt tap is look at distal flow. So many, many valves have a proximal occluder where you put your finger on that occluder get a nice column of CSF in your butterfly needle tubing, then simply um, you know, take the syringe off and you should see that fluid very rapidly run down into the uh, distal tubing. So if that works, that also suggests to you that the shunt is working. So these are just some adjuncts that you can use. Okay, uh, let's do three more questions and then we'll, uh, we'll keep moving. So in the first AV example, could you discuss how you knew the superficial vessel was a vein and not an artery? So that's, that's a good point. Um, so on the CTA, it's hard to, um, to know that. It's hard to differentiate between arteries and veins. On the angiogram, I showed you one static image, but usually these images are um, continuously obtained over, over time, over several seconds. So you can actually watch as the blood makes its way up the internal coronary artery, goes into this vascular malformation and then drains out. You know, you know from anatomy what the superior sagittal sinus looks like. If you're seeing that much earlier, than the rest of the veins, then that suggests that um, that vessel we're dealing with is a vein and not an artery. Uh, 
but you can't really tell from the uh, the head CT. So we have besides fractures, uh, masses, infarcts, and hemorrhages, what other features should we be aware of before labeling a CT as normal? That's a great question. So I'll show you a few other pathologies, um, a little more on MRI, but I think you'll get the idea for, for CAT scan. Um, you know, I think radiologists are very systematic in the way they look through things, um, but I'll show you a few more pathologies and that'll help with that question. So what are your thoughts about shunt check? Um, you know, to be honest, I haven't used shunt check um, myself clinically. I've, I've read about it. Um, you know, I don't know if I have a, a full understanding, but from what I've learned is it looks at temperature changes along the tubing to give the user an idea of whether or not CSF is flowing through. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't know enough um, to give you any more, more details on that. But I haven't, I haven't used it myself yet. And then the last one is how long does a shunt typically last and how frequently do they fail? So unfortunately, um, I would say too much. So there are some studies that show that you could have um, shunt failure within one or some show up to two years, about 40%. So I usually tell that to families when we're placing a shunt. But I also tell them that, um, you know, in our experience, sometimes shunts, patients will have for many years, no problems with shunts. Other times, um, you know, they'll fail multiple times. And the risk of failure is usually higher, you know, with more recently placed shunts. Usually, in terms of infection, usually within the first three months, if someone comes back, you have to worry about infection. Really, after six months, it's much less likely if the shunt hasn't been accessed. And you think more about um, mechanical causes of failure, such as uh, the proximal catheter being clogged, which is very common. Sometimes as kids age, the shunt may pull out of the abdominal space. Other times, if a shunt has been in for many years, um, the body will form calcifications around the shunt, such that um, as a child or adult grows, at some point there's just a tipping point where there's too much tension on that calcified shunt and it will, it will break. So that's another example of shunt failure. Okay, so very good questions, guys. All right, so let's um, focus a little bit more now on MRI. So here we have, again, the three different uh, projections, axial, sagittal, and coronal. And MRIs, as you know, are, are much more detailed than CAT scans. They avoid radiation, but they usually are a little bit harder, to, not as accessible to get, and take a little bit longer. So we'll show how some uh, how these can be very useful. Okay, so MRIs can be obtained under different settings with the magnet, and this yields different sequences. So some of the main sequences for anatomic MRI, T1, T2, and T2 flare. So on the left here is a T1. I like to think of a T1 as the most anatomical um, sequence. So on a T1, the white matter is white, the gray matter is gray, and uh, the ventricles, the fluid, is black. All right, so kind of your normal, what you normally think. T2, everything is flipped. And T2, you know, the fluid is, is bright, the white matter is dark, gray matter is a little bit lighter. T2, I think, is, is very good for showing pathology. So if you're just starting out and you're doing clinic, you know, on your sub eye with the chairman and he says, hey, show me, you know, this patient's scan, probably better to pull up the T2 first because that may show you more clearly any kind of pathology. A T2 flare is pretty much the same as a T2. It's just that the, um, the signal for the, the fluid spaces are inverted, meaning that here CSF is dark. This is nice for conditions like multiple sclerosis where you may have lesions that are bright on T2, and you just want to really contrast the lesions around the ventricle a little bit better than if the ventricle were bright already. So flares are a good one for picking up pathology. So in addition, uh, T2 and T2 flare is good at picking up water. And here we see edema, which is just kind of swelling and water in the brain that's caused by this, this sizable tumor that you see here. So this is called vasogenic edema, meaning the tumor, the blood vessels are not normal and they're leaking out some fluid and you can pick that swelling up with MRI. You can pick it up um, a little bit more faintly on, on head CT as well. Um, another sequence that you'll use commonly is called uh, diffusion restriction. It's usually labeled as B1000. 
So diffusion restriction is very good for looking at strokes within the brain, and really any pathology where um, the lesion is very dense. So some high-grade tumors, things like medulloblastoma, these tumor cells are really packed in together, and these will appear bright on diffusion restriction. In addition, infection also appears bright on diffusion restriction. Now, it's, it's important to check the converse of diffusion restriction, which is the ADC. So usually a lesion that's bright on diffusion restriction will be dark on ADC. If it's bright on both, that suggests something called T2 shine through, where you just have a very bright lesion and it's giving you a false, um, a false signal in terms of diffusion. Okay, so um, another important imaging uh, kind of feature for MRI is contrast enhancement. So during the MRI, the patient will be given a, a bolus usually of gadolinium. It's um, a contrast agent that's used to basically highlight lesions that have breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So you can see here on the left, this is a pre-contrast image. This is post-contrast. You can see this it looks like an aggressive lesion that's, that's lighting up on the contrast. Kind of useful way to determine whether or not a scan has contrast. For me, at least, it's two things. One is the large veins will light up. So this in the back here is the sagittal sinus. You can see that's very bright compared to the pre-contrast scan. The second thing is the nasal mucosa. You see that this is lighting up on the post-contrast compared to pre-contrast. So, you know, sometimes studies get mislabeled, but if you look at the veins and the nose, you'll be able to figure out if it's contrast or not. And clearly, if the pathology lights up, that's, um, that's obviously very helpful as well. So this is just a, a follow-up on that patient. You can see that this tumor was resected through a right temporal approach. It turned out that it was a, a, a high-grade glial tumor, meaning a, a tumor that arises from glial cells within, which, within the brain, which are cells that support the nerve cells. I put this up because this was kind of my way of showing, um, you know, during your junior year, when you want to convey post-op films to someone, you want to show the pre-contrast scan, the post-contrast scan, and usually a diffusion weighted image. So you show uh, the reason, you know, post-contrast, many tumors, you want to make sure that you remove all of the contrast enhancing portion if that's possible. Sometimes you'll see contrast here and you're not sure if that's tumor or just some post-op changes. So if you look, for instance, on the pre-contrast, you see parts lighting up here. You see the same parts pretty much lighting up in the post-contrast. That suggests to me that this is you know, just more scar tissue, not actual tumor tissue, because it was lighting up on the pre-contrast scan. Now, if there was a large nugget of, um, of contrast here, and I did not see it on the pre-contrast, that would make me think there's a large piece of nodular residual enhancing disease left. And of course, you want to check diffusion weighted imaging to make sure there's no large strokes that occurred from your resection if you sacrifice a blood vessel, for instance. So just from a more practical standpoint, these are the, the sequences you'd want to look at after surgery. Okay, so let's apply some of these things to a, a real case. So this was a, um, I believe a man in his, in his mid-50s who came in with some vision changes and headaches. And an imaging was found to have this, um, this lesion. So we see that um, you know, the sinuses are lighting up, the tumor is lighting up. This is a contrasted MRI showing a sagittal coronal axial. And I should also say when you're you know, presenting to attendings or discussing films, it's always helpful to start out by naming what the sequence is, identifying is this a CAT scan, is this an MRI, is this an angiogram, and then stating um, what sequence it is. So you'd say this here is in the middle is a coronal MRI, contrast enhanced, showing, and then you could describe the lesion. So that, that's just a very natural um, way of uh, talking to other colleagues in the field. You can see this lesion is very oblong shaped, and it's about 10 centimeters down from the surface, so quite a long reach, you know, when we're discussing the brain. So I, I like this example because I think it shows you some of the, the thought that goes into a lot of the tumor resections, um, or, or many surgeries within neurosurgery, um, you know, highlights the importance of imaging and then some of the adjuncts that we can use to help us. So one adjunct in terms of imaging is functional imaging. So this is a functional MRI that shows us, basically the patient's in a scanner and they're asked to do something like squeeze a ball or do some, some movement of their hand. You know, we know that the motor strip um, will get uh, increased blood flow and oxygen and this could be picked up on a functional MRI. 
So this is a cortical representation of hand movement, which is shown here. On this slide, this is another modality. This is called um, diffusion tensor imaging. And this um, is used to show different white matter tracks that are, are very important. So I know just from, from basic anatomy that the optic radiation, you know, part of our visual pathway runs just lateral to this tumor. So I'm planning out the surgery. I know that from basic anatomy, but also from our diffusion weighted imaging, I know that the lateral aspect of this tumor, I should not be very aggressive because I could give the patient a worsening field cut, which I believe he had when he arrived partially. Second thing is that this is a very deep tumor. So, you know, another very useful principle for surgery is you always want to try to approach these tumors along their long axis. So really coming in from this trajectory gives you the best view of the tumor. You can imagine coming in something like this, you have a lot of difficulty in trying to get posterior and anterior. So always trying to go along the long axis. Furthermore, because this is such a deep tumor, you have to think about what are some of the safe entry zones to approach this. If you were to take this approach, you probably would be going through the patient's motor strip and giving them a very severe deficit. So you have to pick the area that's least likely to harm the patient or cause collateral damage. Hence the fMRI is very helpful to say, okay, here's our motor strip. We're gonna make our opening. This is an example of the motor strip here. We're gonna make our opening way behind that to be safe. I'm just gonna go back one slide. There's a few other um, <clears throat> anatomic features that you can use to help you figure out where the motor strip is. This is one called the omega sign. So this looks like the, you know, the omega symbol. There's another um, gyrus not shown great here, a sulcus called pars marginalis. And the uh, motor strip is one ahead of that, gyrus ahead of it. Those are uh, some useful ones. And on a coronal, I'm sorry, on a sagittal slice, if you go to the mid-sagittal area, um, let me see if I have this here. I may have it on a later slide, but um, you're able to follow the cingulate gyrus, which I'll show on a later slide, and find both the motor and sensory strip very easily. Okay, so we have all our information. We've planned out a trajectory here. I wanted to show one other useful adjunct, um, which is a tubular retractor. I'm sorry to jump back and forth, but you can imagine that, you know, you kind of have a few options here. One would be you make a cordisectomy or an opening on the surface of the brain. Then you can put very large metal retractors, ribbon retractors, just like you do if you were, you know, doing a GI surgery. And of course, you know, that has some damage. You're, you're pulling aggressively on the, on the brain, you're retracting. You have to have those retractors fixed, either with something like a Greenberg or, or someone else assisting to hold them and to really kind of cone down and get to this depth. So a nice elegant solution to this are these tubular retractors. They're transparent, you can see through them. The tips are blunted. So if they make an opening, you would use navigation to help guide you and you simply pass this cylinder down and it kind of spreads the white matter fibers away. So that's what we did in this case. And this is an example. So you, you know, you're working through this tube and you can see the, the kind of translucent edges. This purple instrument is a bipolar, it's bayoneted so that you know, your, your hands are not blocking your view down this tube. And this is the tumor itself. You can see some patties or kind of cotton here with green strings that you can suction on. You don't want to suction directly on the brain. And this really helps to facilitate getting you from the surface down to the tumor without really injuring the surrounding brain tissue. There's a lot of different types of these retractors, but it's just the principle of a, of a tubular retractor is very helpful when you see on imaging that you're dealing with a very deep lesion. Another great adjunct, which um, you know, we've done at Westchester Medical Center now, is using fluorescent guided surgery. So in this case, um, there's a lot of different fluorescent markers. Um, we used a marker called 5-ALA, which you inject into a vein, and it preferentially binds to tumor cells, high-grade tumor cells. When you switch the light on a microscope, you're able to um, choose a wavelength that highlights these um, the 5-ALA and, and really visualize it as you work. And this helps to show you where tumor cells are. You can see this kind of pink color versus the surrounding darker purple, violet which is normal tissue. So, you know, really for tumor resection, you, you rely a lot on the consistency, the feel of the tumor, the look of it, very subtle changes. This is a great way to help um, ensure you get the maximal safe resection. So this is a, a view of the brain um, at the end of surgery. This tumor entered into the ventricle. So I left a uh, external ventricular drain here to drain any fluid that might accumulate. And you can see that, you know, a large retractor, when you remove it, the white matter really brain is like a sponge. It will be pushed away and then kind of come right back. 
to its own position. And here we are even right before closure, just you know, 10 minutes later, you can see that hole is, is almost closed. And you have a very small, um, small approach here. Uh, this is the post-op scan. You can see um, really not a lot of trauma to the entry point. And uh, you know, we went into the ventricle, this is choroid plexus, but most of the tumor has been resected. Uh, this is a, a CAT CT from uh, a few weeks later showing that you know, this, this tract has really closed down overall. All right, so let's, um, let's see if there are any questions. We have a few here. So could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, T2 shine through? Sure. So um, T2 shine through is where you have a lesion that's very bright on T2, um, but is not something like a high-grade tumor, infection, something you would expect diffusion restriction to um, to show. Therefore, if you look at the ADC map and you find that they're not opposite, meaning if it's bright on DWI and T2, but yet bright on ADC, it probably suggests you're just dealing with a very bright T2 lesion, not something like an infection or, or a very dense tumor. Um, do you find that ADC is helpful in post-op evaluation for tumor resection? Um, you know, to be honest, I, I usually don't look at it routinely. I look at the diffusion weighting, weighted image, and then if something seems out, you know, to not add up, I would look at the ADC. But it's, it's not one that I usually pull for evaluating uh, tumors post-op. I usually look at pre-contrast, post-contrast, DWI. Uh, let's see, you find, I think we had answered this similar question here. And then when are post-op scans typically done post-tumor resection? So that's a very good question. So for glial tumors, you really want to have it done, I would say, within 24 hours. And the reason for that is after surgery, there's this process of scarring in the brain that we call gliosis. And it's very hard if you get a scan more than 48 hours out to differentiate gliosis from residual tumor. So we really try hard to get the scan within 48 hours and preferably within 24 hours. So I think timing does matter for them. If it's another type of tumor, um, something like a meningioma, which we're gonna take a look at you know, some pictures shortly. These are tumors that are outside the brain, have much less gliosis. I would be okay getting that scan at a later time if needed. Uh, there are other tumors, things like pituitary macroadenomas, which we'll take a look at, where you know, the post-op scan doesn't necessarily change your management it's okay to wait and get those in follow-up. Um, that's kind of a special instance, but for most um, cranies that I do, I get a head CT, at least in adults, um, just to check in. You know, some patients are a little slow to wake up from anesthesia, and for that reason, um, I get a CAT scan, you know, post-op day zero, and then post-op day one, I try to get the MRI. And, and usually from a practical standpoint, if you have the MRI, it looks good, they could usually leave the ICU and kind of work towards physical therapy and getting out of the hospital. Just keeping an eye on time, but I think we're doing pretty well. Um, let's see, so we discussed timing for post-op scans. Is contrast always done with T1 and flare with T2? Um, uh, most times, if you're you know, a resident, you have to order the contrast. So if you're concerned for tumor, infection, these are times they order contrast. Um, I believe T2 and flare are usually done together. Um, at the Children's Hospital here at Maria Ferrari, we have a rapid MRI scanner, and um, that's part of the, uh, the protocol to get uh, T2 and flare. Okay, um, in the image looking through the tubular retractor, can you discuss how you tell the tumor apart from the normal brain parenchyma? So yeah, that, that's a key question. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult, to be honest, and as you do more of these, you get a little more of a feel. There's a different consistency to some tumors. Some are very soft and suckable. One kind of teaching point is that if you're able to suction the mass out, it's probably tumor because white matter usually does not come up a, you know, a, a small suction. Um, a lot of it is you use your navigation system. So you'll, you'll try to figure out the boundaries of the lesion. Anytime I could take a lesion out on block, meaning as one piece, I try to do that. It just helps to ensure that you're not leaving any tissue behind. Sometimes if you're in an eloquent part of the brain, like the motor strip, you don't have that luxury where you could do a broad, you know, very circumferential incision, uh, you know, resection around the tumor. It just pushes too much on the normal structures. Instead, you'd want to debulk it from the inside to kind of reduce your manipulation of surrounding tissue. 
and then um, remove it piecemeal. But um, it's difficult to answer the question. And uh, you know, I think a lot of it is just experience, trying to do on block, using your tools that you have, you know, navigation to help you. Okay, for the tumor you just showed, would you take a transfalcine approach? Uh, let me take a look back at that a second. So, transfalcine, you know, I think on the coronal, let's see. So anytime I'm planning out approaches, I like to look at all three <coughs> images. Um, so transfalcine, I guess if you're thinking you want to come in contralateral through the FOPS or under it, I think you'd still, you know, get through a lot of tissue. And for me, the guiding principle is always take the, um, take the long axis of the tumor. So that was kind of my thought process for, for this case. All right, what do you say are advantages, or what do you say on advantages or disadvantages of cottonoid retractors versus tubular retractors? So I would say if it's a very deep lesion um, that you feel you can, it's gonna be somewhat suckable, I think tubular retractors are nice. If it's a very, very large lesion, I find myself using um, you know, cottonoid retractors or people call them different things, um, malleables or brain ribbons. I, I like to use these if um, it's a very large cavity such that kind of a mantle of brain that remains is falling down into your resection cavity. So someone could put a nice wide retractor to help elevate that up. So I think those are, are instances where the, um, those retractors, you know, in my mind, I use those more than tubular retractors. How do you differentiate tumor from surrounding tissues in regions like the cella where there are many structures? So another good question. Um, we'll take a look at some cellular tumors, uh, most common being pituitaries. I think a lot of it relates to your surgical goal. So for instance, with a macroadenoma, many times you're prompted to do surgery because of mass effect of the lesion on the optic chiasm. And really my goal in those cases is to debulk as much as safely possible. So when I suction or use ring curettes, whatever tissue comes out easily, I simply take it. And if there's something that I'm not sure if it's invading the cavernous sinus, let's say, I would, I would just leave that tissue. So sometimes you don't always differentiate, but you wanna make sure you, you kind of stay consistent with your goals of surgery and ultimately not hurt the patient. What is the difference between T2 with flare and T2 and MS? So uh, the T2, um, Basically, in multiple sclerosis, you have white matter demyel demyelination. And many times you could see, they call them Dawson fingers, Dawson's fingers, where you have white matter changes, um, you know, bright signals coming out perpendicular to the ventricle. So both on a T2 and a T2 flare, you'll see those hyper intense fingers. It's just that on the flare sequence, the ventricles are black. So it just highlights them a little bit better. So it just helps you to observe them. How useful is head CT with contrast for patients with contraindications to MRI? Yeah, that, that, that happens a lot. It's a good question in um, clinical practice. Patient has a pacemaker, you need to scan immediately, you're not sure if it's MRI compatible. CT with contrast, I think, is a good alternative. Um, it's not as detailed, but I think it will help you to find tumors and infection. So I think that's um, a very good alternative if an MRI with contrast is not available. So very good. Um, some people tend to order flare contrast images as well. What are the indications for that? Uh, I think as we said, you know, a lot of times the flare comes with um, the T2. So if you order a brain MRI with and without contrast, you'll get a pre-op T1, post-op T1, T2, T2 flare. I think that's pretty standard. It just depends on your hospital and what the protocols the radiologists have. You know, I find if, if I have a, a patient I'm looking for something very specific, I'll usually talk with the radiologist and tell them. And many times they'll have, you know, techniques or, or different things that um, can help to, to better identify those those lesions. So, all right, guys. Yeah, again, very, very good questions. Um, so why don't we um, keep moving here? I think we're doing okay on time. We've got 45 minutes. So, okay, we talked about um, tumor resections. Here's some other pathology now. So this is um, a case of infection. So this is a ring-enhancing lesion. This was a man who, I believe he was in his mid-20s, had a shunt placed at birth, Somehow, I've never seen this before, but his distal catheter and his belly eroded through his bowel and such that E. coli ascended up the catheter into his brain. And he presented to me 
um, you know, with very severe headaches, fever, elevated white count, elevated inflammatory markers such as ESR and CRP. Uh, we got a head CT that showed a lot of swelling in this area and then in the right frontal region, then this MRI. You can actually see this, this here is artifact due to his shunt valve. This is actually a you know, silhouette of the catheter here, and this is all infection. You can see there's mass effects such that it's pushing on the ventricle here. So obviously, um, you know, a very serious condition. So for him, we basically removed his old catheter. I used navigation here to place a brain needle into this abscess. You know, there's, when it has a ring enhancement like this, it's usually a very thick wall and antibiotics will not be able to get in there to help this. So, and we also wanted to get a, um, an organism. So I use a, a brain needle to navigate into this lesion, all pus, you know, shot out from there. And I did not go after this one surgically because it's, um, you know, it probably cause a lot of damage. But with antibiotics in about three months, this is his scan afterwards and pretty much resolved. All his inflammatory markers were normal. It turned out that um, I placed an external ventricular drain while we were treating his infection. I was able to clamp that drain, the patient had no deterioration. So it made me think that the shunt may have been placed for, um, you know, in, in correct um, indications initially. And, you know, I, I've never really pulled out a shunt in someone who needs a shunt, but this patient um, has been without a shunt for over six months. I, did, I just don't think he needed it to begin with. Um, and anytime you can avoid foreign bodies in the study of infection, that's, that's always ideal. So that's an intracranial abscess. This is another one, and this is definitely a surgical emergency because you can imagine if this abscess were to rupture, and you can see the wall is usually a little bit thinner here. All these, this, you know, cyst contents, purulent material can go into the ventricles and then get spread throughout the CSF and cause, you know, a very severe ventriculitis. So this is a case I'd argue is a, it's an emergency. And ring enhancing lesions I showed, actually very common, and there's many uh, pathologies for it. So this is a mnemonic, um, magic doc. So M is for metastases. A is for abscess, which we looked at. G is glioblastoma. So we touched on this, but this is, um, you know, a very high-grade glial tumor in the brain. Um, infarct, especially in the subacute phase. Contusions, so anytime there's trauma. Demyelinating disease. Tumefactive MS is where we have demyelination to a very large extent that it almost looks like an enhancing tumor. And then radiation necrosis, where if a patient is treated with radiation and delayed fashion, they can develop uh, radiographic changes. So we'll look at a few of those. Now, if I were to show you these six pictures and not show you the key down here, you'd have no way of, with certainty of telling me what's what. Um, just, I can tell you just from history, this is a metastasis, an abscess, radiation necrosis, GVM or glioblastoma, contusion. I believe this is a contusion as well. So ring enhancement, you want to think broadly and really the clinical context is going to help you. If you happen to see multiple ring enhancing lesions, that pushes you more towards metastatic disease. If a patient is, is showing signs of fever, white count, that pushes you more towards abscess. Just of note, patients can come in with normal white counts, no fevers and still have an abscess. So those things are, are you know, not specific findings. Um, radiation necrosis. If the patient's had radiation or not, of course, it's important in the history. Um, and then a few other factors you could help you between GBM and METS. Usually metastases have a lot more edema associated with them, kind of almost out of proportion to the size of the lesion. Whereas GBMs will have edema, but um, not quite as much as a metastasis. And then contusions, obviously you look for history of trauma. Here's a few other examples, um, picture of MS. Lymphoma is really a, a great imitator. Uh, lymphoma also will diffusion restrict. So you can see how really looking at a combination of different MR sequences can help you to, uh, to better narrow down your differential. And here's a few others that we looked at. Um, Sister psychosis, I had a, um, a case of recently, so I'll share that one with you. So this is a, a woman in her 30s who came in with very severe headaches and vomiting. And she had these calcified lesions, which we believe were um, these parasitic infections from neurocystocercosis that her body had kind of walled off over time. But we did get an MRI, and if you look very closely, there's this kind of enhancing area within the fourth ventricle and this very thin walled cyst. 
So this was a patient we were worried was developing hydrocephalus. Her ventricles are not that enlarged here, but just with her symptoms. And we decided to take this out. So I'll try to play this, um, this video. Let's see if this plays for us. Try one more time here. And Ryan, if, if you're there, do you think um, any uh, tips on maybe trying to get this video to play? Uh, let's see, one other option I can do, I believe I have this on my desktop. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, actually, uh, I'm going to try to um, pull this up on my desktop screen here. Okay, so hey Ryan, are you able to let me know if you could see this uh, new shared screen? Yeah, I can see it, no problem. I think it, it looks good. Thanks, okay. So um, so this is, we're, we're in the fourth ventricle now. So the patient's, um, this is the dura that's been opened. The patient's uh, head is up this way, we're prone. In the back of the neck, this is, um, I'm gonna pause just for a second. This is the, the spine going down here, so we've removed uh, we've done a suboccipital craniectomy, so this is cerebellum. These are the cerebellar tonsils. These are uh, brain tissue that um, kind of flanks the fourth ventricle, where on the sagittal MRI we saw this lesion. So um, we're using bayonets here to spread the tonsils to access the fourth ventricle and pull out this, this parasitic lesion. So, you know, we're kind of um, have a suction here for some retraction, kind of gently back and forth trying to mobilize this. An assistant comes in with this um, grasping instrument, and I spread. This is a, a cottonoid patty with a blue stripe. And there he really grabs this tissue, and here we go. Basically pulls this, um, this parasite out. So that was, you know, hopefully uh, no one's eating anything right now. All right, so I'm going to switch back um, to the presentation here. So, all right. Can you guys see my main presentation again? Looks good. All right, thanks again. Okay, so now um, let me check if there's some questions and we'll move on to uh, talk about some tumors here. All right, so what are some ways to differentiate a new tumor enhancement and radiation necrosis post-resection with radiation? Yeah, so that, that's, um, you know, something people are actively working on. There are some more advanced sequences, such as perfusion imaging, where um, you know changes in perfusion can help to differentiate these. Um, some of the work that I did in the past was trying to use machine learning tools to try to differentiate this, but there's not a great um, method to do it with certainty. Many times what ends up happening is if it's a GBM, for instance, and there's new enhancement. If the patient's doing well and there's not a lot of mass effect, we usually don't rush in to take this to take that lesion out. Sometimes for clinical trials, it will require a biopsy of the material to see if it's um, more consistent with tumor versus radiation. Uh, but those are, you know, kind of the, the clinical way it plays out. Um, you know, pseudo progression is something else to think about. It's basically where patients are treated but then they develop new contrast enhancement in the cavity. The patient I'm following with the same thing. And um, you know, he's doing very well clinically, so we're just following him with surveillance imaging you know, every two to four months. But that's a great question and things people are actively working on. Uh, do you ever find neurocystricosis, lymphoma, or toxo to also have ring enhancement? Absolutely. So lymphoma, toxo, these are all um, ring enhancing lesions. For toxo, it's usually multiple. And there are some blood tests that you could send for toxo. For lymphoma, um, you could have ophthalmology do a slit lamp experiment. You could do lumbar punctures to send for cytology. So these are some adjuncts 
if all of those fail, a biopsy is usually indicated. Or in the case we showed for neurocystic sarcosis, you could do a resection potentially. Okay, so in a patient in an ongoing um, radiation therapy for GBM, how do you differentiate lesion is improving or the radiation causes further damage? Yeah, so that's, that's again, um, one of the things we, we mentioned. Um, it's, it's very hard to know. So short answer is there are some adjuncts, but you end up just following the patient clinically. And if whatever it is, if it's tumor recurrence or if it's radiation necrosis, if it's exerting mass effect, you may consider going into resected. Okay, could you please show tumor factive MS and how to differentiate it from GBM? Uh, you know, it's, I'd say there's not a great way. Um, let me see, I think I had one tumor factive. Uh, yeah, so you could argue tumor factive MS is here. Not a great way. Um, for MS, you could do other tests, um, the visual evoke potentials, sending off CSF. So there's a few adjuncts. And again, you know, a lot of these ring enhancing lesions look the same. It's going to depend a lot on the clinical history and other testing to differentiate them. And ultimately, sometimes pathology. You know, there have been cases where, you know, we don't think it's lymphoma, we get in there, it is lymphoma, and we simply stop, which is important because lymphoma is usually very treatable um, you know, by medicine or radiation. Okay, and then in terms of MRI ring enhancing lesions, how can you differentiate an infarct from a ring lesion of a cortical venous thrombosis? Uh, so that's an interesting question. So I think for subacute bleeds, I'm sorry, subacute infarcts, um, you see ring enhancement. Usually cortical venous thrombosis, you will see um, more of a, a territory that is affected and sometimes there could be blood products inside that. Basically in venous thrombosis, the, there's venous hypertension such that there could be bleeds that occur under pressure. So that's probably how I would indirectly do it. But again, not a, not a clear cut differentiation. Okay, let's jump ahead a little bit. So um, really another key thing is extraaxial versus intraaxial. So is the tumor coming from the outside pushing in on the brain or is it starting from the brain itself? That could also change your operative approach in many cases. If it's extraaxial like a large meningioma, I usually will do a much larger craniotomy or opening in order to um, really be able to get around it. If it's something deep in the brain, of course, you can think about what part of the brain you're in, but sometimes you know once you're in, you can kind of suction and work inside the lesion. You don't need such a, such a large opening. So a very good distinction. This applies for when you're looking at pictures of spinal cord tumors and, and elsewhere. Okay, so this lesion, a little hard to say just on these pictures alone, but this is an extra axial lesion. This is a meningioma. So this arises from the coverings of the meninges of the brain. It pushes onto the brain, uh, but does not usually invade it. Um, sometimes if you notice T2 signal or edema, that suggests that you know, there are tumor cells that are invading the brain or affecting it. And this patient underwent, a, uh, I believe, a bicoronal incision to remove this lesion. Um, this is, a, this is a, a specific type of meningioma that we call uh, parafalci. And these can be interesting because it's very important to, to figure out their relationship with the, sag the superior sagittal sinus. So depending on several factors like the patient's age, you may resect this lesion, but at the time of surgery, see if it's invading the sagittal sinus, you may choose to actually leave some of that tissue and later can follow this um, with imaging, depending on its, um, its grade and potentially do radiation therapy. Um, if someone were to ask you what part of the sinus is safer to sacrifice if you had to, is it the anterior third, the middle third, or the posterior third? My answer would be it's safer to sacrifice the anterior third. So that's something that you may be asked in the future. Okay, this um, lesion is a little bit different. This is an intraaxial lesion. And when we give contrast, which you can tell it's lighting up here in the sinus, this tumor does not light up. So this is what we would call a low-grade tumor. However, it is seen very clearly on a flare image. Here's a pretty sizable uh, tumor here. It's contrast enhancing. Uh, this was taken out through a right frontal approach. And you can see it originated from the ventricle. Um, most high grade, uh, like things like glioblastoma, many people have traced um, having origins in the ventricle. It's thought that there are some um, 
stem cells that are in that area potentially that can give rise to these tumors. Um, so this, again, just showing here how contrast enhancement usually suggests a more virulent or higher grade tumor. This actually turned out to be a, a very unusual tumor called an ATRT, a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. This was in a 23 year old male. Usually you see them more commonly in young children, but, but a very, very aggressive lesion. Uh, this patient, unfortunately, despite a, a good resection, passed away um, a few months later from recurrence of this lesion. Okay, here's a few more pictures. Um, this is a patient, um, I believe in his 70s, who presented with um, speech issues. So you can see this is located on the left side. A little hard to tell just from the axial images, but very close to his language areas. Um, you can see it has some, on the head CT, what we've learned, you know, a little bit bright areas, so blood products. Contrast enhancement on the MRI, you see the sagittal sinus lighting up. It's got edema around it, and it's effacing the ventricle. So this was a case of, uh, we did a resection, removed the lesion, case of metastatic melanoma. Melanoma is one that's known to um, be a little more hemorrhagic among the types of lesions that, that metastasize. Other very common metastases, uh, just one based on numbers is lung. So lung mets are most common. Breast, melanoma, um, GI. I'd say those are, are some very common ones. Um, I'd like to show a few examples of different pathologies based on location. So one location is the cerebellopontine angle. So we have your cerebellum, the pons. It's kind of the angle that it makes. And there's a lot of different uh, pathologies here. One is a schwannoma, which is a, um, you know, along the vestibular nerve most commonly, cranial nerve eight. People refer to that as an acoustic neuroma. Those patients usually present with a combination of vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. So you can see this lesion is um, right in the CP angle, tracking out along the nerve. Reasons for surgery would be if they're compressing on the brainstem as they grow. Uh, another example, more commonly than aneurysm, is an arachnoid cyst, a meningioma, and epidermoid. I'd say those four are um, very common in this area. Some other hints, and then they give this mnemonic here, same. Some other hints, um, meningiomas will uh, grow in a way that will narrow the um, internal auditory canal whereas schwannomas will um, actually sculpt out and expand the opening and, and sculpt out the bone further. Meningiomas, I'll show another example where they have a dural tail. They originate from the covering on the brain and therefore you can see a dural tail. Epidermoids uh, show diffusion restriction. So that's a very nice way. If you look at that sequence, there's restriction. That's a good way of telling you what tumor you're dealing with. Here's some other examples. Acoustic neuroma or what we call a vestibular schwannoma. It's a dural tail, suggesting more meningioma. These arrows show some other examples of dural tails here. Here's an example of diffusion restriction. You can see this bright area, suggesting an epidermoid. So again, the combination of different sequences and just knowledge of some of these, these features can be very helpful. Um, intraventricular tumors are another class of lesions um, go over based on location. This is a choroid plexus, probably a choroid plexus papilloma. These can be very um, bloody cases and usually you have to find really a main feeding vessel to really get control of this. These are very commonly associated with hydrocephalus. Some people think it's because the tumor produces fluid. Other times it could be obstructing the normal flow of fluid. This is a lesion. Um, the pathology came back as a central neurocytoma. There are other similarly shaped lesions um, such as subependymal nodules or subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, SAGAs. Um, so really a host of lesions that are found in the ventricle. Sometimes with very large ventricles and smaller lesions than this, you could approach them endoscopically, meaning coming with a camera through the CSF and ventricle. Other times um, you cannot. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna have to just pause just for one moment, if that's all right. Hello? Uh, it is, I'm just um, in the presentation. Can I call back shortly? Yeah. 
Thanks so much. Okay, I'm sorry guys. Um, so now we're gonna take a look at the posterior fossa. So the differential diagnosis here um, varies based on the age of the patient. So for adults, by far the most common lesion is a metastatic lesion. So really the top three things in your diagnosis should be metastasis for anyone who comes in an adult with a posterior fossa lesion like this. Um, this was a gentleman, very heavy smoker um, in his 50s, I believe, who came in with balance issues. And you can imagine with compression of this fourth ventricle, you know, his, his developed hydrocephalus. Also um, in coordination, which, um, you know, makes sense that this affects the cerebellum. So this patient had a resection. Um, and again, showing this more just to show that metastasis is really the top of the differential. So for adults, the second most common lesion is a hemangioblastoma. This is actually a low-grade lesion. Um, they come in kind of two different flavors. The more common one is this one, where there's a, a very bright nodule, um, which is your vascular lesion, and it, it produces a cyst fluid. And you know, with surgery, this can be a cure for the patient if, if this mural nodule is removed. Um, really, you do not have to go after the walls of the cyst. Once the nodule is removed, the cyst fluid doesn't get produced, and you could really help a patient with this one. This is a more solid um, appearing one. So this one is cystic, less common is a solid appearing hemangioblastoma. These can be very difficult to take out surgically. They're almost like an ABM. They're very highly vascular. In this patient, we got an angiogram and ended up embolizing uh, about a third of this lesion. And again, very similar presentation of hydrocephalus and incoordination. So things like finger to nose um, was off. So in children, a completely different differential. Some of the most common ones are JPA, so juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, shown here. Similar to hemangioblastoma, it has a mural nodule and then a cystic component to it. Uh, very common is medulloblastoma. This arises from the roof of the fourth ventricle. Um, and then ependymoma. Some people call these plastic tumors in that they actually take up this, the shape of the ventricle and sometimes will go out those foramina that we discussed early on, foramina of uh, Lushka, for instance and could involve some of the lower cranial nerves. So again, a, a, you know, something I think is useful to know for uh, differentials when dealing with tumors in different locations. Here's another uh, location. This is a tumor in the brainstem. Now in the past, these were called DIPGs. So diffuse infiltrating pontiglioma. Some of the WHO criteria has changed and usually these are called diffuse midline gliomas. And you have a characteristic um, histone mutation Unfortunately, these tumors are, are somewhat difficult to treat. You know, these tumors are, are usually lower grade, but they intermingle with many of the normal um, neurons in, in the brainstem, such that if you were to do a surgery, you would have really unacceptable amount of collateral damage. So these are not usually resected. More frequently though, they're biopsied. So this patient um, underwent a right frontal biopsy where we passed the needle down from the top of the head all the way down, which is um, you know, always a little bit disconcerting. But we got a good sample of tissue, and based on that, we're able to identify some gene mutations to enroll her in a clinical trial. Really, the, the cornerstone for this is, at this time is radiation treatment, but it's definitely an area of active research. Okay. Let me just take a quick look at some questions here. Uh, can you expand on why anterior one-third of superior sagittal sinus sacrifice is preferred? So, um, you know, anytime you're sacrificing a sinus, you know, it shouldn't be done... Um, for, for no reason, uh, but if you had to, um, the, the first third is a little bit safer in that a lot of the major bridging veins are found more posteriorly, especially in the middle and posterior portions. You can actually see how, you know, even in this picture we, we happen to be looking at, it's, it's much more diminutive in, in the anterior part, not as many large veins, and as you get further back it enlarges. So I think part of it is um, just the natural anatomy, the way the bridging veins come in, and um, a little bit less eloquent area in the front here. So again, you know, you never want to take the sinus, you know, lightly. Um, but if you ever had to, you, you could get away with it a little more in the anterior portion. So if you have a meningioma where you're really trying to go for a cure, but um, I think I think surveillance and radiation is a very good alternative. Okay, why is okay? So that's we, we answered the second question here, and then diffusion weighting imaging is helpful to differentiate which ring enhancing lesions. Um, I would say lymphoma infection. GBM, these are all things that actually will 
could be ring enhancing and, and then could diffusion restrict. So, um, you know, even though you have an extra sequence, still not the most um, specific. And then metastatic melanoma, could that be confused with an oligodendroglioma due to hemorrhage and calcification? Um, yeah, I think so. That's a good point. Um, and that oligos are usually um, kind of the gray white interface. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, um, you know, with surgery, you'll be able to get um, tissue. And I think either one will probably, you know, prompt you to do surgery. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Okay, so a few more uh, tumor cases. So this is an example of some lesions in the cellar region. So this, this kind of area in the sphenoid bone. So here we have um, some pituitary tumors. We have a, a microadenoma. You can see very nicely the uh, pituitary stalk in the midline here. And then macroadenoma, which we see in a coronal and sagittal view. So really, I think it's worth just briefly discussing some of the indications for surgery for pituitary tumors. Really, in my mind, I counsel patients that there are two reasons to do surgery for pituitary gland tumors. One is if the tumor is secretory, meaning if it will secrete different hormones. Um, a simple blood test can, can, can look for these. Of course, prolactin is one that you want to check uh, right off the bat because that's something that can be treated with, with medicine rather than surgery. And some of the other uh, common hormones um, that you do a full, full panel on. So if those hormones are elevated, that could have deleterious effects on the body such that surgery um, could potentially cure the patient if you get all the adenoma out. Second thing, which applies a little bit more to macroadenomas, which are just defined as, as larger pituitary tumors, uh, if it's pushing on the optic chiasm or the optic apparatus. So you can only almost make out here a little bit the left-sided optic chiasm, but this tumor is definitely touching it and it seems to be compressing the right side. This is a patient who had, rights, who had visual field deficits and was offered surgery for that reason. So really two reasons. One, if it's, it's secreting tumor that could lead to endocrine dysfunction where there's too much of a certain hormone or and or if it's pushing on the optic nerve causing vision decline. And of course you want to have the patient see my ophthalmologist to do an objective test of it. One of the lesions which I, I meant to include here is a craniopharyngioma. These lesions are usually in the supercellar space, um, so kind of above the gland. They on head CT usually present with calcification and on MRI, you can usually see a, a large cystic component to them. So that's another tumor of that region. Um, here we have a tumor of the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is a very small pea-sized gland that sits um, in this region. Here it's very much enlarged. This was a, a, uh, was a three-year-old boy who presented with hydrocephalus. So it basically came out of Tundid with a six-nerve palsy. And, you know, the sixth nerve is, is one that um, is preferentially more affected sometimes with increased pressure. So you can see a patient's eye, when it should be being pulled out, it's pulled more medial. This patient got an ETV, I'm sorry, got an EVD followed by this MRI. <clears throat> we sent off tumor markers. And this was, oops, sorry, this was concerning for um, a pineal lesion. We actually did a, a surgery coming in um, supertentorially through the part of the corpus callosum to resect this and got a good, good resection. The patient had uh, chemo radiation. This was, I'm sorry, just chemotherapy for pineoblastoma. So a mass that you may see in the pineal region. The differential here is, is quite broad. Uh, there are germinomas, teratomas, choriocarcinoma, um, embryonal yolk, yolk sac tumors, embryonal carcinoma. Um, if I didn't mention an immature teratoma. So really the the clinical workup here is to send off markers from the blood and ideally from the CSF for beta HCG and alpha fetoprotein. Based on those, you may have an idea of what this is. If not, it could require um, biopsy. For some pineal tumors, um, to treat the hydrocephalus, you can do an ETV through a burr hole and then either through the same burr hole or one more anteriorly positioned, you come with an endoscope and take a sample. In this case, the markers were positive such that a resection was, was indicated. I'm sorry, actually, in his case, we did an ETV, a biopsy, 
got markers and then found that it was pineoblastoma based on the biopsy and then took for resection. Okay. Um, you know, we've been talking about lesions in different parts of the brain. This is a lesion in what we call eloquent cortex. I mentioned earlier that uh, one way to find the, the central lobule or the parts that do sensory and motor cortex, you could look for the cingulate. This is a, a gyrus just above the ventricle. And where this sulcus um, ends, everything in front of that is, is the central lobule. So basically sensory and motor. Central sulcus would be somewhere in here. So this lesion actually sits right in this area. And you want to think about, is this intraaxial or extraaxial? Um, I don't have as many um, slides, but you take my word, this was intraaxial. Because of such an eloquent location, there was discussion about um, doing the surgery awake versus asleep with motor mapping versus simply taking a biopsy. Um, so just, you know, again, real life example, we discussed this at a brain tumor conference. I had favored biopsy as one other surgeon, another favored more aggressive resection. So it just shows you that there's not always a clear cut um, you know, approach for these, but these are the things to think about. This patient's going to get an fMRI to better help designate the, the uh, motor center. And again, I think I brushed on this earlier, but ways to figure out motor strip uh, or what's called precentral gyrus. This is the central sulcus. This is the postcentral gyrus or sensory strip. You can find uh, this pars bracket and look uh, two gyri ahead. You can find this omega sign. I usually find the omega sign to be very helpful. And on a sagittal, this, um, this trick of basically following the cingulate back and then finding, I had said central, but this is the paracentral lobule. Okay, sensory and motor. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, oncology. I just wanted to throw in an imaging slide for epilepsy. Um, you know, many of the tumors we looked at, including some low-grade tumors, can also be epilogenic foci and give rise to seizures. Other pathology you can see on, radi on radiology is uh, something mesial temporal sclerosis, for instance, which we see here in a flare. This hippocampus is, um, is much brighter than the other side. You can also see sometimes atrophy and other changes. So let's see, we have two questions, and then we'll try to wrap up um, the last segment of this. Is there CSF cyto testing for histopath genetics you can do for some brainstem gliomas adjacent to the third or fourth ventricles instead of biopsy? Um, that's a good thought. Sometimes if the brainstem tumors are exophytic, you use a part that um, extends off the tissue, you actually may go in and do surgery to get um, a sample or to open up some of the CSF channels to avoid hydrocephalus. I don't know if these tumors would, um, if, if cells would kind of get into the CSF from, from this kind of infiltrative location. There are people doing blood tests to find um, markers of uh, tumor tumors or tumor DNA based on blood tests, but I don't know of that for um, brain stem gliomas in the CSF, but very interesting thought. Uh, in the image of the microadenoma, how do you differentiate the tumor from the pituitary? So it's, it's that small cystic structure um, on the patient's left. Usually the pituitary um, has a bright spot posteriorly, which is the posterior pituitary and the rest is dark. But if you see a little um, circle like that, that, that clues you in that there could be a, um, a tumor there. Sometimes it's very difficult or there could be more than one little cyst, um, in which case, you know, and, um, Petrus uh, sinus sampling can be done, although that's debated how much um, laterality that gives you, laterality information that gives you. So good question. Okay, so just in the last um, five to 10 minutes here, some pictures for developmental things like CSF um, changes. So this is an example of a Chiari-1 malformation. So this is the uh, cerebellum, this is the tonsil, this is the bottom of the skull, the frame and magnum. So if you draw a line here from the clivus to the, the, the base of the skull, you see this tissue expands beyond that. And you'll see different cutoffs. You know, technically, these, these range by age, but five or six millimeters is something that many people cite. The, the problem here is that the posterior fossa is a little bit too small for the brain. And you can see that there's nice CSF in front of the cord. There's really not much here. There's a lot of different theories about this too, but I thought that with every pulsation, some CSF beats into the central canal in the spinal cord such that it gives rise to a serum. Now this combination, I would argue, in a symptomatic patient, very clearly is something that should be treated. 
the treatment for this is to, to basically address the underlying pathology, which is a small posterior fossa. As a surgeon, your job is to make that posterior fossa bigger. So you can do a suboccipital crane, where um, this patient, she was um, a 15-year-old girl, volleyball player. She had been told that she was clumsy her whole life. I told her not to worry. It may be in part, uh, you know, due to this anatomic issue. Um, came in with uh, right-sided numbness and um, incoordination, and as well as headaches that were the classic Valsalva type, meaning if she strains, you know, bends over to lift something, she gets headaches in the suboccipital region that sometimes would radiate up to the vertex. So very classic. Um, myelopathy could be associated with this condition as well. So we did a suboccipital cranial her. We also took off the ring of C1 posteriorly. And you could see how all the CSF now can flow much, much nicer through here, both in front of the cord and behind the cord. There's just a lot more space here. Um, a little small amount of fluid looks like it leaked out, uh, but not enough to uh, cause a large pseudomeningocele or a collection of CSF under the tissue here. Basically, once the bone is removed, the dura is opened. And then to make more space, a patch is sewn in to expand that dural compartment. I believe in her case, since the tonsils were, were quite low, I did coagulate the tonsils to shrink them, but that's something that's somewhat controversial. I think if you're going to do that maneuver, you have to make sure not to coagulate the medial surface for fear of scarring down and really blocking the flow of CSF. But uh, during the surgery, you want to visualize a structure called the obex, which is really the start of the central canal, where the fourth ventricle kind of goes into the central canal of the spinal cord. And, and her symptoms got much better after the surgery. Okay, and then um, just very quickly, we'll touch on craniosynostosis. So when, you know, when a baby is born, the skull is not completely fused. Um, in order to get out the birth canal, you want to have these plates of bone that can override and then later in life, they could grow together. Oops, sorry. So craniosynostosis is simply a condition where these suture lines fuse a little bit too early. Um, where these sutures converge, you have the anterior fontanelle and then the back posterior fontanelle. So it's kind of a, a pattern to closure, and there's a lot of variability here, but most kids, posterior fontanelle closes about three months. Anterior fontanelle could be you know, up to two years. The metopic suture between the two frontal bones around eight months. And another suture like the coronal or um, landoid, they, they, they close much later in life. So craniosynostosis simply refers to the premature fusion of sutures. That then lead, gives rise to abnormal head shape. So really a, a key component I wanted to, to convey here, and then we can get the last remaining questions. Um, you know, growth goes perpendicular to a suture. So for instance, if this sagittal suture is fused, there will be no growth left and right in the perpendicular direction. Instead, growth will occur at the other suture sites. And without growth right left, in this case of sagittal synostosis, you get a very long scaphocephalic head, almost like a boat shape people refer to it as, where there's occipital bulleting. So you're, you're basically, by fusing here, you restrict growth in a right left direction. Um, let's see, okay. Sorry to bounce around a little bit. Um, in this case here, this is coronal synostosis. So again, your growth occurs perpendicular to your open um, suture lines. In this case, the coronal suture is fused. You're not getting growth up down, you're getting growth now only left right. And this, this is a descriptive term brachycephaly. Kind of have this um, widened head. Lastly, um, just basically the way that children sometimes lay, these bones are so soft in young kids that it can lead to what's called acquired um, positional plagiocephaly. So babies may have flattening of one side of the head. Really the take home message here, is you want to differentiate this from lambdoid synostosis. And what I think of here is, is a mudslide. Basically, in positional plagiocephaly, you think about a mudslide, everything gets pushed forward on the side of flattening. The back of the head is pushed flat here, the ear is, is forward compared to the other side, and then the forehead is pushed forward. So really everything in this direction suggests plagiocephaly. If, however, this is flat and the ear is back, when you're taking a bird's eye look down on the child, that's considered lambdoid synostosis, and that's something that's much more rare and something that you would treat with surgery. Here's just an example of multiple different um, synostoses. But the underlying principle to remember is that growth occurs perpendicular, and when the suture is fused, you don't get growth in that direction, and, and there's too much growth perpendicular to the open suture. All right, so this just shows a few examples. Uh, 
Let's see, I'll tell you, I'll answer this one question. Can you point out the OBEX? Um, yes, let me uh, do that quickly. So OBEX is hard to see. If I had a nice um, coronal, maybe we could see it, but it's going to be somewhere in this um, area here. But it's not really possible to see here, unfortunately. And okay, so here's just a, in the last few minutes, these are some examples here. So this is sagittal synostosis. You see this very long shape, boat shaped head. You don't see the sagittal suture here on this 3D reconstruction. Very common, you know, the most common one we see. Coronal synostosis. Uh, if we're looking down, we see that the suture is fused here, that there's a little bit of frontal bossing on the opposite side. Second most common. Metopic synostosis, you have this, this very cone shaped uh, part of the front of the head, very triangular shaped, which you can see here as well. Okay, and lambdoid synostosis. You can you know, definitely see there's an asymmetry with the ears. So, all right, well, that um, I think brings us pretty close to five o'clock. Um, don't see any other questions, but I want to thank everyone very much for their attention and for the opportunity to. To speak with you again, I, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I think it's a great um, lecture series that, that you guys have here and I'm very um, honored to be a part of it. So thank you very much. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.